Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Corey Marshall. Um, I am a family medicine doc um, in the upstate New York, uh, Pennsylvania area. Um, I work in a residency program training um, training physicians, and I also um, do some work with addiction medicine and, and LGBTQ. Um, and then part of my work is um, also uh, taking care of, of pregnant people and delivering babies. So um, I also have up here, um, I graduated from the Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba. Um, I just want to take a quick second before I get started to kind of plug that program. Um, so people may or may not be aware of it, but the Latin American School of Medicine is a free, um, a full scholarship medical school um, in Cuba that um, was a, a major project of um, the Cuban Revolution in terms of um, trying to provide health care um, you know, internationally, not just in their own country. So they started the school um, to train young people from different countries where there was a medical need to become physicians and then go back to their country and work in underserved um, areas. Um, they do have a certain number of spots open for um, US citizens to go. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll put up some information about if you know somebody who's interested, if you're interested in how to apply for that program. Um, but I highly recommend it. Um, worked out really great for me. So um, so to get started with the with the presentation, um, the I'm going to go over a few things during the course of this presentation. Um, the idea was to really give people some of the scientific grounding to understand a lot of the reproductive rights um, you know, struggles that are happening right now. Um, so I'm gonna go over um, some information about contraception. Um, you know, Obviously the big discussion right now is about abortion rights, but um, there's some idea that contraception is gonna be more under attack um, coming up soon too. So important to understand um, kind of that access to to effective contraception. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the stages of pregnancy, um, some different milestones, different things that you can know and, and testing that we do throughout pregnancy. Um, and then I'm also going to go through um, the types of abortion um, and a little bit of history about, you know, how those have been permitted and not permitted in the country, um, especially talking about medication abortion, which is kind of a a newer thing for us. Um, uh, and then we'll kind of go through um, a few other details after that. So go ahead and get started. Um, so why is all of this stuff important? You know, we talk a lot about, you know, right to abortion is important just because people should be able to do, you know, have, have, um, bodily autonomy, be able to do with their body what they want. But there's kind of other um, issues beyond that. Um, one of the really important facts is that it's becoming increasingly dangerous to give birth in the United States. Um, our maternal mortality is getting worse. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of risks that go along with being pregnant um, that aren't being addressed. So, you know, when people are being forced to give birth, we're also putting them at risk, you know, their health at risk. Um, we have a big problem with not having access to, to reproductive health services, um, contraception options um, are, are not available to people, either because there aren't people trained to do them or um, because of insurance issues, things like that. Um, and then we just don't have a good social safety network for taking care of children that are born. We don't have childcare. We don't, you know, our healthcare system is not what it should be. Um, so this might feel a little bit like health class, um, but I'm gonna go through some of the basics of uh, human reproduction. So on your left, um, this is, uh, the female reproductive system. And I just want to note, I'm going to use the term female reproductive system from a purely kind of biological perspective, um, just as the, the female reproductive organs. But obviously, this is also an issue that um, affects trans men. Um, so you'll see the ovaries, the uterus, and the fallopian tube. 
Um, this is kind of the basic parts of the body. On the right hand side, this is a, um, a chart that kind of goes through the menstrual cycle. So for clinical purposes, we start the menstrual cycle at as the first day of your last period. Um, really, the reason that's chosen is because it's just easy to see. Um, we know when your period starts, a person can know when that happens. And so um, at the beginning of this, you'll see kind of the, the sloughing off of the lining. So at the top, it's it's showing the hormones that are dominant during the different parts. So estri estradiol is just estrogen. It's a, you know, a specific name for a type of estrogen. Um, and then progesterone um, in the purple line. Um, and then the lower part of it is showing uh, basically a graphic representation of the uterine lining. So um, this is where uh, a fertilized egg would implant. Um, so you see in that first section from day zero to the next, you know, four or five days, that's when all that lining is sloughing off. Um, and then based on the effect of the estrogen that you see in that first half, the first 14 days, you're going to have a building up of the lining of the uterus. Um, at day 14, that's when ovulation happens. And then after that, the estrogen levels drop and you become progesterone dominant. So the progesterone levels go up and that's what kind of maintains that lining of the uterus um, for the possibility of, of a um, fertilized egg to implant. And then what really triggers that next part of the cycle, um, which is, is menstruation again, is that drop in progesterone level. So this is the thing that's really worth noting. You see the progesterone levels high throughout the cycle, throughout that second half of the cycle, and then it drops. And so that drop in progesterone is what triggers the next part of the cycle. The reason why that's important is one, this is a big part of the mechanism of how medication abortions work. Um, and this is also the basis of most um, hormonal contraception is gonna be based on progesterone effect. So basically by not, um, in the case of, of birth control, by maintaining that progesterone level, not letting it drop, that, that kind of stops the cycle. Um, and in medication abortion, the medication that they use is, a, um, is an anti-progesterone medication. So it kind of helps to create a, a drop like that in progesterone. Um, but we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So um, how does contraception work in general? There's a few different mechanisms depending on what type of contraception you're talking about. So there's the obvious stuff, barrier methods. So that's things like condoms um, that just don't allow sperm to get through. Um, the surgical uh, contraception, so a vasectomy or um, having your tubes tied works on the same concept, just doesn't allow sperm to get through to the egg. Um, copper IUD is kind of its own mechanism. It's a, it's a different, um, one than any of the others. And it creates a local inflammatory reaction inside the uterus, um, which basically just kills the sperm. Um, if the sperm does manage to make it to an egg, it just kind of kills off that. If, if that manages to happen, it also just creates a kind of um, uh, a not welcoming environment um, inside the uterus for implantation. Um, and then you have your hormonal methods of contraception. Um, these have a couple different um, mechanisms. Um, it can stop ovulation is a big one. It can thicken the cervical mucus. So um, the mucus right at the entry um, to the uterus and it basically won't let sperm get through. Um, or it can change the transport of the egg through the fallopian tubes. And that's actually a, a kind of important in fertilization of an egg that usually happens in the fallopian tubes. So if you change that environment, um, it's not gonna, work as well. Um, so I'm not going to go over all the details of this. This um, slide is from the CDC um, on types of, of, comp of contraception that are available. Um, it gives you just a, a few different ideas. Um, the, the big takeaway from this um, is about the types of contraception that we use in the United States. So there's a, a class of contraception called um, LARCs. Uh, long acting reversible contraception, LARC. Um, and they are generally speaking kind of the most, um, the, the best in terms of um, effective contraception. So that's up here at the top, you'll see impl the implant, which is called Nexplanon, um, used to be called Norplant um, in a different form. Um, and then you have the IUDs, both the copper and the hormonal IUDs. Um, you'll see these little percentages underneath 
what those percentages mean are um, the failure rate. So out of 100 women, uh, 100 people in, in one given year, this is how many will get pregnant um, using that form of contraception. So if you see like the, the next one on the implant is actually more effective than getting a vasectomy, it's more effective than um, getting a, a tubal ligation, um, getting your tubes tied. Um, and then what we use mostly in this country is um, oral contraception or the pill, um, and that has a 9% fail rate, meaning you know nine, nine people out of 100 in a given year who are using that are gonna get pregnant. So that's a pretty, um, that's not a great um, uh, effectiveness rate. Um, you know, one of the things in our country that's um, difficult is that we really underutilize the long-acting reversible contraception. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, with the way that our healthcare system set up and what that availability is. Um, you know, the difficulty with these is that they do require somebody who knows how to do them um, and they require, um, you know, time. And they're also a little bit more expensive, although over the course of the device, it's really not as expensive as the pill, but there's a, a cost up front. Um, so, you know, limitations in access because of not having somebody who can do it, um, making people come back for multiple appointments before they'll place the device, um, not having insurance coverage, that kind of thing um, has been a big issue. Um, there was actually a so we use it much less than the rest of the developed world. Um, most of the developed world uses the implants and IUDs as their main form of contraception. Um, there was a pretty good study done where um, they basically gave people comprehensive education about the different types of birth control that were available and then offered to place it same day for patients. And um, this was in the United States. And when they did that, the rate of using these long acting reversible contraception went up, um, you know, very significantly to something like 70 or 80 percent. Um, so it's really a, a question of lacking those resources um, to have those placed for people. So um, there's just kind of regular preventive contraception and then there's emergency contraception. So um, there's three basic types of emergency contraception. Um, the copper IUD, the Paragard, um, is probably the most effective of emergency contraception. It can be used up to five days after unprotected sex. Um, it does require somebody to place it. Um, you know, this is really the best of the emergency contraception, especially because it also then can stay in place and be used as regular contraception. Um, not used very much, unfortunately. And the real reason for that is that you have to place it within five days. And, you know, I don't know what people's experience is with getting a, a, a appointment with their doc within five days, but that tends to be pretty difficult. So it's pretty hard to get the timing on that um, correct. Um, so another kind of failure in our system. Um, it's also pretty pricey. Um, Although again, this one is good for um, 12 years after placement. So definitely worth it long run. Um, and then there's levonorgestrel or plan B. Um, plan B is basically just the same hormone that's used in oral contraception, um, but at a higher dose. Um, so it's most effective three days after unprotected sex, but it can be used up to five days. Um, it's pretty highly effective. The big problem with this is, um, it was studied in people under 165 pounds. So, you know, there's a lot of us who weigh more than that. Um, and that that uh, effectiveness goes down significantly um, once you get into heavier people. Um, it is available without a prescription, which is very nice. It's over the counter, um, typically costs 40 to 50 bucks. Usually with insurance, they're only gonna cover it if it's prescribed by a doctor. So that's kind of a barrier there. Um, but sometimes insurance will cover this. Um, and then you have Ella or Eulopristol. Um, this is effective up to five days um, after unprotected sex. It's about 85% effective. This one, still there's a weight issue. Um, it's a little bit higher though, so 195 pounds. Um, and this one does require a prescription, although there are some states that have allowed it to be prescribed by the pharmacist. So you just have to go into the pharmacy and talk to the pharmacist um, and they can prescribe it for you. So 
that's kind of the overview of contraception. Um, going into some basics about pregnancy and how pregnancy happens. Um, the the zero mark is the fir the last the first day of your last period, um, and that's where we count gestational age from. Um, those first two weeks, though, th the reason why that's chosen is just because it's clinically kind of easy to identify when somebody had their period. Um, but those first two weeks of gestation are really fictitious. There's nothing there yet, right? It's not until week two that something's actually happening. So week two is when ovulation happens, and in that week, fertilization will happen around the same time. Um, at week three, you have implantation. Um, and then week four is when a pregnancy test uh, is going to turn positive. So that's the um, basically the day of your missed period. So when you should have gotten a period. Um, this is really important um, in talking about um, the heartbeat bills, um, the kind of early abortion bans. Um, a lot of those were looking at the six week mark um, as a place to ban them, but understanding that week four is the first time you can get a positive pregnancy test. Um, it's the first time a person's going to miss their period. Um, so saying a six week embryo really, um, it's much younger than that. And, and six weeks only gives you a week or two to really understand um, that you're pregnant and figure out what to do about it. Um, and I will say that most people don't know right on the day that they miss their period that they're pregnant. So, you know, there's some normal variation in that. Some people's periods are a couple days late and that can be pretty typical. Um, so usually, you know, for an unwanted pregnancy, it's somewhere like week five or six that you're even figuring out that you're pregnant or much later. Um, so this is just looking at some of the, um, what you would find on ultrasound in these early pregnancies. Um, so, this first one is the four to five weeks. You really just see a little dot of fluid starting to form. Um, at five weeks, you'll start to see a yolk sac, um, which is that perfect little circle right there forming. Um, that's what's gonna go on to be like placenta and that kind of thing. Um, and then six weeks is when you start to see a little bit of an embryo. So it's just that little nubbin right at the top of the circle um, and then by seven to eight weeks is when you start to see something a little bit more formed. And this is when you're going to see that first kind of cardiac activity happening, um, usually at, at week seven. Um, also worthwhile noting, um, you know, kind of for ease, we call it cardiac activity. Um, there's not really a formed heart in a fetus until about um, 15 weeks. Um, at this stage, it's kind of a rudimentary you know, what will become a heart later on, um, but it doesn't have any of the characteristics that we normally think of with a heart, like the, you know, the human heart's pretty complicated. It has four chambers and lots of valves in between it. None of that stuff exists at this stage. It's just kind of a little tube. So uh, moving on throughout the pregnancy. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, the exact details are not super important, um, but I did just want to kind of give an overview. This is the different types of testing that you can have done during a pregnancy. Um, so the kind of the earliest testing is at week 10 um, and it's a blood test and that can start to look for some um, genetic abnormalities in the um, fetus. Uh, a week 11 to 13, there's a type of ultrasound that can be done. Week 15 to 22, um, some more blood testing that can look for some more genetic malformations, um, some malformations in the um, formation of the brain um, and the spine. And then the week 18 to 22 um, ultrasound, that's kind of the, the big place where you're gonna get the most information about things that could be you know, going wrong with the development. Um, that ultrasound is called the anatomy ultrasound. Um, you know, it, it goes through um, a number of different parts of the baby or the fetus looking at, you know, brain development, um, the, the formation of different organs in the body, that kind of thing. Um, so these are, this is the big testing that we do for those types of abnormalities. I think it's really important to point out that there isn't like a point where you know everything that you can know um, about a pregnancy. Um, abnormalities can be found at any stage of the pregnancy, you know, up to and including the day, you know, um, a baby is born. So 
um, there really isn't a point when you know everything. Um, and this image here is just showing um, the procedure for an amniocentesis, which is one of the kind of follow-up tests that you might do if something was abnormal, um, just a, a needle going through the belly into the fluid around the baby and collecting some of that fluid. Um, and then some of the fun stuff. So um, those first fetal movements are typically felt somewhere between the 18 to 22 week mark, um, a little earlier if it's a um, if it's not your first pregnancy. Um, fetal viability is a question that comes up. Um, it's hard to pin an exact date and and kind of what that means. You'll hear it said anything between 22 and 26 weeks, um, meaning. Uh, you know, fetal viability, meaning the point when the um, fetus could be born and have a chance of surviving. Um, it has a lot to do with the hospital that they're born in and what resources are available, that kind of thing. Um, 24 weeks. So the thing to keep in mind, though, um, a fetus born at 24 weeks is going to have about a 50% chance of, um, you know, surviving um, out of the NICU. Um, and that's just talking about survival. Um, you know, then there's the question of, you know, how healthy those kids are going to be, um, what their quality of life is going to be, what kind of comorbidities they have. Um, and then you get to 34 week mark. Um, that's when the survival is greater than 98%. Typically, um, if they make it to 34 weeks, they're in good shape. Uh, 37 weeks is a full term um, pregnancy. And then 40 weeks is when we determine the due date. So, um, so talking about the different types of pregnancy termination, um, there's, they're split into medication and surgical. Um, so medication, which is becoming increasingly popular um, in the United States, um, can be done up to 10 to 13 weeks of pregnancy, very low risk of complication, pretty highly effective. Um, it's the procedure for this is a dose of mifeprestone, um, which is an anti-progesterone medication. So like we talked about in that first slide, um, this is going to block, um, block that progesterone hormone that's kind of the dominant pregnancy hormone. Um, and then that's going to be followed about 24 to 48 hours later by a medication called misoprostol. Um, misoprostol is um, a medication that just causes uterine contraction. So it's going to create, you know, contractions in the uterus to, to push the contents out. Um, that medication is actually also used to induce labor um, at lower doses. So this same protocol is used um, in the management of a type of miscarriage called a missed abortion. So typically when we think about miscarriage, you think about people having bleeding and cramping and, and kind of um, passing the contents of the uterus. There's another relatively common form of um, miscarriage called a missed abortion where you don't get the bleeding and cramping, but we go and we do an ultrasound and um, there isn't any cardiac activity or it's not growing. Um, something's telling us that, that this pregnancy is not gonna continue. Um, and so in that case, those patients need to be treated um, to remove those um, products of conception from the uterus. And so it's the same exact protocol that we use for that as we do for um, an early medication abortion. Um, there is an alternative protocol which um, does not use mifeprestone and only uses misoprostol, um, but it's a much less effective um, protocol. Um, and mifeprestone is the, the medication that's kind of in the news right now in terms of um, uh, regulations around it. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and so at the end of, of one of these, this does require, um, so patients are given these medications that go home and kind of do this at home. Um, it doesn't require as much um, kind of medical oversight. Um, and then typically you're gonna wanna have people follow up, um, you know, about a month later, either to do an ultrasound to confirm that everything's passed or um, you can have people do a negative pregnancy or do a pregnancy test as long as it's negative, then that tells you that um, everything's done. So a little bit of history of um, mifeprestone and regulations regarding mifeprestone. So it was discovered in um, 1988 in France. Um, it became, you know, used there um, at that time. It took another 12 years before it was approved in the U.S. Um, 
the there was a lot of um, kind of activism that went into to getting it approved in the U.S. Um, it was approved with something called a REMS or a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. This is something that the FDA uses for medications that they feel are um, kind of more dangerous, um, present more risk to the patient. Um, and so basically there's regulations about how that medication can be prescribed and dispensed. Um, so according to the REMS for myth mifeprestone, it had to be dispensed in person and it had to be dispensed by the prescribing provider. So typically when I'm going to write, you know, when I'm going to give somebody a medication, I write a prescription, send it to the pharmacy and they go pick it up from the pharmacy. In this case, I had to have the medication, you know, in my office and hand it to the person myself, even though they were going to go home and take it at home, I had to physically hand it to them. Um, you know, this was done under the guise of safety, although there was never any there's never been any evidence for um, a significant risk to, to the patient um, in using this medication. So it was really a, a, a way of you know, politicizing this. Um, in 2020, the, the REMS was modified um, to allow telehealth visits and having the medication mailed to the patient. That was a result of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, they did this for a lot of other medications that were under REMS. Um, that had similar um, rules. Um, and again, there was a lot of activism involved in, in getting this approved, you know, getting an injunction to, to kind of um, pause that part of the REMS to allow people to get this through telehealth. Um, basically, the argument was that you're forcing these people to be exposed to COVID to get healthcare when it really wasn't necessary. So in 2023, um, that modification that had been made to the REMS for the COVID-19 emergency was made permanent. Um, and so that requirement that it had to be dispensed by the provider was, um, so so that allowed telehealth and, and mailing of the medication. And then they also removed the, the requirement um, that it be dispensed by a provider. So that was actually huge. This was a huge step forward um, in terms of availability of um, medication abortion, um, you know, the next step kind of going forward is to see to what extent pharmacies are going to actually carry the medication. Um, but that means, for instance, in my practice, I can I can prescribe this now. I wasn't able to before because we didn't um, stock it at the pharmacy where I work. Now I can just write a prescription to a pharmacy. So this is actually really great. Um, it's going to have to play out a little bit to see where things go and to what extent providers are going to start using this medication more. Um, looking at you know what pharmacies are going to actually carry it. So far, where I live, nobody has started carrying it yet. So still waiting for that. Um, and part of that has to do with the pharmacies have to go through kind of a process to get certified for it. Um, also this year, a federal judge in Texas ruled to remove FDA approval for mifeprestone, basically saying that it hadn't gone through appropriate um, approval process when it was originally approved in 2000. Um, and then just a couple days ago, um, the Supreme Court overturned that ruling, um, which was wonderful. So um, for the time being right now, um, it looks like mifeprestone is, is safe. Um, but of course, we'll have to see where that goes. Um, so other type of pregnancy termination is um, surgical. There's really two surgical um, procedures and the difference between them just has to do with the gestational age, so how far along you are in the pregnancy. Um, a, a DNC, dilation and curatage, um, really can be done at any stage of pregnancy. There are some providers who will wait until five to six weeks um, before they'll do it. Um, and that goes up to about 14 to 16 weeks. Very highly effective. Um, for that procedure, um, the cervix, the opening to the uterus is dilated just a little bit and then a thin suction catheter is placed and just kind of everything sucked out. Um, when you get a little further along, um, that procedure becomes a dilation and evacuation. Very similar procedure, the cervix is dilated a little bit, um, but instead of using suction, things are kind of um, scooped out. So this is a really nice, um, option it's it is what historically has been used the most um, doesn't require any kind of specific follow-up you can start birth control immediately um, you can actually do one of these procedures and then place an IUD all in the same um, kind of procedure um, but again this does require training requires personnel um, has to be done in a medical facility so 
um, definitely a little bit more costly. So just some basic important facts about um, pregnancy. Uh, one of the big things is that a little bit over 50% of abortions that are done in the United States now are medical, and that number has been climbing significantly. Um, I, I want to say about seven, eight years ago, it was 40%. Um, it's gone up to 50%, and we've only had it for the last 23 years. So this is really becoming the, the dominant, um, I expect that trend to continue, and this is becoming the dominant form of abortion in the United States. Um, most abortions that happen are happening before the nine week gestation mark. So very early in the pregnancy, that's four fifths of pregnancies. Um, and then just, you know, overall abortion is very common. 20% um, of pregnancies in the United States are gonna end in a termination. So one fifth of pregnancies, people are gonna decide to terminate. Um, it's a very safe procedure, whether it's the medical or surgical. Um, mortality is um, 0.5, per 100,000, um, and it has been at that rate since um, they began tracking this data since abortion was legalized in the 70s. It's been less than one per 100,000, um, which is, you know, very good numbers. So lots of misinformation um, about abortion. Um, shout out to Jacob. Thank you for sharing this, um, the, these resources with me. Um, this is kind of a, a pamphlet that gets handed out um, out um, outside of like an abortion clinic, that kind of thing. Some of the misinformation. And when I first got this and started to look at it, I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to go through piece by piece and and kind of um, talk about um, you know counter each of these topics. The more I look at it, you know, it's not even worth doing that because basically everything in here is crap. Um, there isn't really any kind of scientific basis for anything that's being said in here. Um, these issues about, um, you know, emotional um, feelings after abortion, um, you know, there's there's actually some studies. The, the dominant um, emotion people have after having an abortion is relief. Um, that's the most common and, and uh, most prevalent. Um, you know, and, and all these kind of um, things that they're talking about are really not based in any kind of um, science. So instead, what I want to do is give you guys some information, some positive information, some things we know. So um, there was a study done called the Turnaway Study, um, really interesting, uh, included a thousand people who were um, seeking abortion um, across uh, clinics in 21 different states. Um, and basically they, they took these thousand women um, and followed them. So some of the people were able to have an abortion, some of the people were not, um, typically based on being past the gestational age that was allowed for the state that they were in. Um, and so they, they followed this population um, of a thousand women over um, the following five years um, and asked a ton of different questions. Um, I believe they, they basically called them and did a phone interview every six months for five years. Um, they asked questions about kind of economics. They asked questions about mental and physical health, um, you know, about their other children, just kind of a ton of information, a big survey of, of kind of things that could happen as a result of either having an abortion or being denied an abortion when you were seeking one. Um, it was a pretty important study. Um, it's produced a lot of um, papers, a lot of um, information was gained from this. So a few key points that they got out of this study. Um, so implications of being denied an abortion, um, those people who had sought an abortion and, and weren't able to have one had much higher um, rates of bankruptcy. They were more likely to have been evicted. Um, their credit scores um, were lower as compared to um, those who had been successful in, in having an abortion. Um, they were much less likely to be able to cover basic costs like housing and food, um, and that effect lasted at least four years, um, possibly more, but, but they were able to show at least the four years. Um, people who were denied an abortion were much more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner, um, so much more domestic abuse. Um, they actually showed worse um, you know, developmental outcomes for the existing children um, of people who had had, uh, who had been denied an abortion. So comparing, you know, outcomes for those children already in the home. Um, 
for women who had had an abortion or, or been denied an abortion. And then just higher rates of chronic pain, higher rates of joint pain, um, headaches, uh, kind of medical conditions, morbidity um, along those lines. So this one is another just really telling um, uh, slide. What this slide is looking at is, is um, maternal mortality rates in the United States. So the first, um, this is over the last four years, the last year that we have data for that's been kind of fully compiled is 2021. Um, and this is looking at um, the, the likelihood to die related to um, having a baby. So um, this is reported in deaths per 100,000 um, live births. And so you'll see these numbers um, in 2018, it was 17.4. And now in 2021, it is almost doubled to 32.9. Um, and then I just want to compare that back to the risk of um, death from uh, a pregnancy termination, which was 0.5 per 100,000. So really important, it's much more dangerous to have a child, um, to give birth to a child than to terminate a pregnancy by far. Now, another really, really concerning thing in this graph is, um, so one is that the, there's this, this trend in the wrong direction, right? The um, maternal mortality in the United States is going in exactly the wrong direction. Um, the rest of the world, it's going down and, and we're, or the rest of the developed world, at least it's going down and we're going up. So like that, that alone is a very disturbing trend. But then if you look at the second section, um, the non-Hispanic black, um, population. So that population has always had and continues to have almost a or more than double the risk um, of of death related to giving birth. So that's really key. I mean, this represents a very big failing in our healthcare system um, that this population is so at risk. These rates, this a seventy percent. Um, or a 70 per 100,000 um, mort maternal mortality is, you know, is just insane for um, the developed world. It's completely unacceptable. Um, you know, and it's interesting because there's lots of arguments about um, does this have to do with kind of socioeconomic factors? There was a very interesting study done in New York City um, over the course of five years. I think it was about a, um, 10 years ago that they did this study um, looking at maternal mortality um, based on um, a bunch of different factors, race, socioeconomic status, that kind of thing. And they showed that um, a, um, a person, so a, um, sorry, a black woman with a college degree, um, with a four-year college degree, had a higher mortality rate, a higher risk of dying related to pregnancy than a white woman without um, a high school education. So really shows that that this is not just something that you can blame on kind of the socioeconomic status, but that 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 uh, kind of ingrained racism within the healthcare system um, is is really something that's present and, and has not been addressed um, and really needs to be addressed. There's some movements now to start talking about it, um, but clearly this is not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, so key takeaway, it is very dangerous to, you know, relatively speaking, um, as compared to, to terminating a pregnancy to, to actually have a baby. So I think it's also really important to, to point out, you know, a lot of the discussion around reproductive rights is about access to abortion, um, but that's really only one part of this discussion. Um, you know, it's not just about abortion, it's actually, you know, it's when we say we're pro-choice, it's really, you know, people are pro-choice. We want people to have the ability to make informed choices and to have access to the full array of, of care. We want people to, not have children when they don't want them, but also to be able to have children when they do want them and to have them successfully. Um, so, you know, really looking at improving pregnancy related health care, um, you know, doing something to to address the maternal mortality rates, especially in those, you know, most affected populations. Um, you know, we also should be talking about ensuring access to reproductive technologies, um, in vitro fertilization, that kind of thing. It, you know, it's so many people 
don't have access to those things because it's not covered by their insurance um, or it's only partially covered by their insurance and it's so expensive. Um, and then, you know, things to make um, life livable once we do have kids to be able to successfully raise children. So things like mandatory paid family leave, universal child care, shorter working days, um, you know, these are all big factors in, in the struggle for reproductive rights. So I just wanted to point out a few references for people. Um, this is where most of the information from my presentation comes from, but also these are just good resources um, to have on hand. Um, the Center for Disease Control has very good health statistics um, information available on their website. Um, there's the Guttmacher Institute, um, and they kind of track um, information regarding um, abortion laws and regulations on a state-by-state -state basis and they'll also tell you about some of the kind of advocacy going on. Um, Aid Access is a great resource. Um, it provides um, medication abortion through telehealth to all 50 states. Um, it is an international organization so um, for some of the states where abortion is um, not currently legal um, they use international providers um, and the medication gets mailed from an international pharmacy. Um, so this is something that can be really good for people in those places um, with much stricter regulations or with, um, with um, where abortions are illegal. Um, and then abortionfinder.org, um, this list, you can use it to search for a local provider in your area. Um, also really importantly, there's links to funding resources. So one of the other issues to talk about in terms of abortion access is, you know, the paying for it. Um, I, you know, live in, in New York, which is one of the states that probably the state that has the least amount of restrictions around abortion. Um, and I still frequently have patients who are unable um, to access an abortion, usually for things like they can't find childcare, um, they can't drive to the place where the abortion would happen, um, they don't have the cash to pay for it. Um, abortions are not typically covered by people's medical insurance, very rare that it is. Um, so Abortion Finder helps with funding resources, um, not just to pay for the abortion, but also for some of those costs that go along with it, like transportation and childcare. Um, and then just back to my little plug about the Latin American School of Medicine. Um, I just wanted to give some information about um, how to apply if you're interested and kind of what those prerequisites are. All right, thank you guys very much for listening. Okay, well, we'll open the floor now for uh, comments and questions. Uh, we will not uh, be reading any comments or questions. So if you have a comment or question, please uh, just use your mouse to click the picture of the raised hand, the, click the raised hand icon to indicate you want to uh, introduce a question or comment, and we will uh, find you on the uh, list of participants we have here and we will open your mic. You will, if you want to speak, you can right now open your mic on your end just by clicking the mic. And then when we come to you, clicking the picture of the mic, and then when we come to you, we can, you'll, you'll be ready to uh, speak. So I am now unmuting the mic of Kazu. Kazu, please unmute your mic on your end. Just click the picture. Kazu, click the, click the picture, use your mouth. There you are. Speak up, please. Okay. Um, just in uh, terms of, it was very interesting, and thank you so much. Um, just one point I have that was very personal for me was when I had to have an abortion, or when I chose to have one, <clears throat> in the 70s. It took me 20 years before I could get over it until I read an article about, um, for me, it was like to mourn the death of that child. And I'm not saying that most women are not relieved, they are. I'm just saying that we should also be sensitive to those people who 
have to have an abortion for whatever emotional reasons, family reasons or whatever. And sometimes it could be very heart wrenching. So I just wanted to say, you know, to add that, if you could add that into um, a, a sentence or two into your presentation, um, I think it's just a sensitivity thing. Okay, thank you. Let's, I suggest that, thank you for your comment. I suggest we take a few comments and then turn, go come back to you, uh, uh, Corey. Thank you, uh, Kazu. Uh, now we're looking for more raised hands. Okay, Ryder, we're opening your mic. Ryder, Smith, your mic is, there you are. Speak up, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very informative, especially the uh, AIDS access uh, website. Uh, I was curious, uh, when you're going over the uh, forms of contraceptives, it seemed like there wasn't a irreversible form of contraceptive for uh, the male reproductive system, and the only one that we have of a similar uh, route would be the vasectomy, which was uh, permanent. Is there any work being done into either a pill form for male contraceptive or an IUD type device? Okay, thank you, Ryder. Let's take one more, Corey. Uh, okay, Paul, your mic is Paul Kachaha. Your mic is open on our end. Click the picture of the mic. There you are. There Hi. you are. Uh, thank you very much, Corey, for doing this. And I, um, I think the um, an essential part of uh, your presentation that I really liked was that. Um, you know, the emphasis on the racist basis of our healthcare system and how women and uh, people of color, um, uh, women of color, and uh, in particular poor women are, um, and also poor white women are affected by the uh, racist policies that uh, have developed since the beginning of our uh, so-called healthcare system. And it's a, uh, it's something that uh, those of us in the, in uh, trying to uh, win a uh, Medicare for all, for example, for everybody, national health care program, those of us who are fighting for that are um, um, trying to emphasize uh, to the rest of the uh, country the um, basis, the racist basis of our health care system. Okay, thank you, Paul. Let's take uh, Laura. Okay, Laura, your mic, there you are. Yeah. Hi, Corey, thanks for the excellent presentation. I think your framing of reproductive rights in that really broad way was really important and I wrote down those notes. Um, I have a question for you. What did you think about Bill Clinton's comment years ago saying abortion should be safe, secure, and rare? Because my response initially was positive, I, I thought, isn't it better to prevent pregnancy for people who don't got, want to get pregnant and then leaving abortion doctors having more time for them to do other kinds of care? Um, but that statement is also considered kind of liberal. So I'd just be curious about your comment on, on that statement, if you recall that. Thank you. Okay, Corey, we'll turn it over to you. Um, yeah, so uh, real quick for Ryder, um, unfortunately, we haven't figured out anything good for male contraception. There is some work being done to kind of find things. Um, a few uh, things have been put through testing. Nothing's been um, real um, successful. So unfortunately, aside from vasectomy, that burden is still being um, left primarily with, um, with women. Um, for Kazu, in terms of the question of, of people's feelings after abortion, you know, it's actually one of the things in my experience that I feel like we're, the whole abortion debate is really doing such a disservice um, to people who, for whatever reason, need to access abortion care. Um, you know, because we've politicized this so much, because we've turned this into this, this kind of political question, we're really not letting people um, have 
you know, appropriate emotional experiences after this because everything is so loaded by the politics of it. Um, I don't know how many times I, I have people who come in. Um, the, the area I live is very conservative. Um, the abortion question is, is, you know, a very hot topic there. Um, lots of pro-life people um, in that area. And I don't know how many people who I have who come in and tell me they're totally opposed to abortion, but they had one, right? Because it was their special situation. But you know, in general, they're opposed to it. it. It's becoming this thing where like people are being forced to live with those types of con contradictions because it's become this political thing instead of just being a healthcare um, point. You know, people have abortions for so many reasons. Um, you know, and and those experiences are so difficult. And the fact that we don't let women mourn the loss of those children, even when they have um, a totally desired um, termination. You know, those those decisions are not easy ones. I think that we overblow in terms of like how hard that decision is. For some people, it's very easy. For some people, it's a very conflictual um, uh, decision to make. But really, it, it shouldn't be about what other people are thinking or what other people are telling you. It should, you know, it should be allowed to be a decision that you make for yourself um, and, and have those emotions um, about without that outside judgment, without all the politics that we've put into the this question. Um, and and for for Laura, I, I think I would kind of agree with you um, on a, a hesitation about the safe, secure, and rare um, comment. I, um, you know, abortions are safe, um, and the question of when they need to happen or not is after a person's already pregnant. So they're pregnant. Um, and so people have them or don't. Overall, like I agree with the idea of, of um, prevention. Um, prevention is key um, and really important in healthcare, um, but it's not always possible. And, you know, the question of how rare it is um, doesn't really matter to me. I would much rather everybody have an abortion when they don't want a child. Um, then, then try to push that. I think we should be pushing things for prevention, but that doesn't change anything about how accessible abortions should be. Um, and just to give a little bit of context, um, I studied in, in Cuba, uh, as you can see here, um, and Cuba has um, very open um, regulations around abortions. Um, they are very freely accessible um, to anybody and lots of people use them. Um, they used a form that was what they would call a regulation. So very early um, abortion right around um, the time of a missed period. Um, and, you know, they were relatively common, um, especially in, in young women in people, you know, 16, 17 year olds. And um, I think that's great because I want people to have access to that. So yes, obviously we would like to to prevent things if we can, but a lot of times it just doesn't happen. We can't do it. Um, and so I don't think the rarity is is a really important thing that we should be focusing on. Okay, let's take another uh, set of comments and questions. Uh, Eva, we're opening your mic. Eva, your mic is open on our end. There you are. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment. I, I studied physiology and I graduated back in, back in 87. And those times, all we learned about was the pill. It's all the knowledge I have. And I was really thrown back that there's so many new available methods to do things. And um, I also just wondered, in, the, in Cuba, I don't know when they start early so-called sex education, but um, when do, is it high school or even grade school that kids learn about how things occur and the choices available to women? Thank you. Uh, we have one other mic open. I'm sorry, we have one other hand. Irving, your mic is open. Open the mic on your end just by clicking the, there you are. Oh, okay. I guess with all this, we probably know that we probably need a single payer health insurance. But do you really, really, you think that that's, that's the only way out for this? Because there's so many angles that, uh, that are blocked. And without the single payer health insurance and without something more than ACA, 
I feel that this is going to be a constant struggle. What do oh. you think? Okay, thank you. And we will look for any more hands. We're looking for hands. Let me do one more pass through to see if there are any more hands. Okay, Corey, you have the mic for the final time. So please include your summary comments. Um, so uh, for Eva, the um, Cuba sex ed. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly when um, they start sex education in Cuba. I would um, imagine that it's kind of in the grade school um, ages. I can just say that in general, um, they tend to be very, um, the Cuban people are very health literate in general. Um, so people have a pretty good understanding of um, their health conditions and kind of um, pay attention to them and, and are informed. Um, they tend to be relatively sex positive. I think um, a lot of those conversations are happening in families and, and uh, um, and, you know, kids are learning about this thing kind of about these things kind of naturally from their parents and, and from the community, um, you know, especially on the question of abortion. Um, it's very common there. Um, a lot of people have had abortion. So, you know, usually their mom has had an abortion or, you know, a relative or something. So those things are pretty openly talked about. Um, they, they don't tend to be shy about it. Um, and then the question of um, I mean, I would take it even if for Irving, I would take it even a step further. I don't even know if single payer is enough to solve this problem. We, I think a national health care system um, is probably the real answer, although um, single payer would be uh, definitely a great step in the right direction. Um, you know, the place that I've seen this worked is Cuba, which has a national health care system. Um, I, I think, though, that there's a lot of things that can be done prior to getting that um, to kind of improve um, improve access to these things. The, the ACA was a huge step forward um, in terms of having um, contraception covered. Um, the kind of religious exemptions is problematic. Um, and uh, there's some signaling from the Supreme Court that, um, you know, the, the um, contraception access might also be under attack. That part of the ACA might be under attack. So um, something to look out for. Um, and yeah, that's, that's everything I have. Um, thanks everybody for coming and listening. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions or anything, I'd be happy to, um, share other resources or, or, um, uh, give people other information if you're interested. Um, I can share my email address with you. It's, uh, Theo R I P Marshall at, gmail.com. Um, feel free to contact me that way if you have any questions or anything. Okay. Uh, we'd like to thank Corey for uh, taking time out of her vacation to participate with us this morning. Uh, very uh, informative. Um, and uh, so we really do appreciate uh, the time and effort and work to uh, help us to understand the challenges, um, both the science aspect of it, as well as the social and political uh, aspects. So uh, hopefully uh, we will be together again next Sunday, uh, April 30th at 12 noon Eastern for the Civil Rights uh, Unionism Book Talk. And we hope that uh, many of you will join us uh, May 30th through uh, June 10th for the uh, CPUSA uh, National Online Marxist School. So thank you again, Corey, and we look forward to maybe a future class on the difference between a uh, single payer and national healthcare system. So uh, we uh, uh, encourage you to uh, prepare so that we can <laughs> have that class sometime soon. All right, thank you everyone. And, and we look forward to your participation in upcoming activities. Thank you again, Corey. Thank and you. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your vacation. Oh, I will. All right, thank you, bye-bye.
Thank you, everyone.